Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and call the September meeting of the Cobb County Board of Elections and Registration to order at 3 p.m. Um, thank you uh, to my fellow board members for being here, as well as to members of uh, our county. And we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I do want to note for those of you that may have the agenda, whether you're participating here in person um, or for those that are joining us virtually, we are going to make one minor uh, revision to the agenda. Um, so if you are following along, please note that uh, the item number six that is reserved for me uh, will actually take place after board comment. So items six and seven will be reversed. They'll be flip-flopped. With that, I note that we have a number of individuals that have signed up to make public comment um, here in the room, as well as one that is online. Uh, is uh, Shelley Northrup, as we always do, we'll take those individuals that are um, joining us virtually first. Is uh, Ms. Northrup um, in the WebEx? She is. She is available, and I've just made her uh, a new friend. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Shelley Northrup, and I reside in Smyrna in Cobb County. I wanted to first thank the Cobb Board of Elections for securing Sunday voting for Cobb County voters. This is a this is a great improvement in increasing voter access, which is greatly appreciated. Um, as we continue towards the general election, the board must do everything it can to ensure that all eligible voters have access to the ballot um, the ballot box. And they can do this first by keeping the old headquarters on Whitlock as an early voting location, as most voters or many voters are used to using that location and has received a lot of traffic in um, over the years. And removing it will probably uncause will probably cause unnecessary confusion for voters. Um, second, as there are many voters going to the polls this year, and with the new voter laws, the risk of long lines is even greater. So the board needs to take steps to ensure that early voting um, is as smooth as possible and that voters do not have to suffer in long lines as I have had previously in previous years. Um, third, the board should be should be prepared to handle any voting emergencies and train poll workers accordingly. Um, they also need to make sure that the safety of all poll, worker, poll workers um, and that they're well trained to prevent anyone from interfering with the election process. Fourth, as there have been about 157 vote, vote by mail applications that have been rejected as of last week, um, the board should make sure that they are processing vote by, by mail applications and reporting the vote by mail application rejections in a timely manner so voters can remedy these issues and then are able to cast their ballots. Um, finally, the board should do everything in their power to make voting by mail processing efficient and timely, including mailing out all approved ballots on the first eligible day of October 10th um, and beginning to process return ball ballots on October 24th as allowed by the Georgia law. Um, thank you again to the board and everything you all have been doing this past year um, and all of your commitment to, to, to the voters at Cobb County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Northrup. Next, we'll move to those that have signed up for public comment here uh, in the commissioner's chambers. Is it Kano Bias? Kent Bias. I apologize. No, it's not. <laughs> Your handwriting, my lack of glasses. Just as a reminder, I know that during last month's meeting, we limited uh, public comment to five or to two minutes. We're back to five minutes. And just for the sake of clarity, that limitation was placed last meeting because of the number of individuals that um, were signed up, recognizing that we also had time limitations not imposed upon by ourselves, but by the individuals that had a meeting uh, following uh, this meeting last Monday. Um, or last month, we will from time to time um, make changes to that timing um, as um, as required or as necess uh, necessitated uh, based upon the circumstances. But go ahead, Mr. Bias. So you have the mo five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kent Bice, and I'm a resident of Cobb County. I live in Powder Springs, and I also want to thank the members of the Cobb. County Board of, it, of Electors for securing a Sunday afternoon for early voting. 
two years after this pandemic began, we are still living in what I'm calling strange times. Two years ago, the Secretary of State mailed absentee ballots to all eligible voters, and many people voted by mail. I've been canvassing this election cycle, and almost no one I spoke to plans to vote by mail. The rules have changed, making it harder to apply. As of September 5th, as the last speaker said, Cobb has rejected 157 vote by mail applications due to a missing date of birth, election dates, or incorrect election dates. Many of the voters I spoke to said they plan to vote early in person. The Cobb County Board of Elections must do everything it can to ensure that all eligible voters have access to the ballot box. In 2020, many Georgians waited in hours long lines. According to the Center for New Data, in the 2020 general election, 22% of Cobb early voters had to wait over an hour to vote and 62% of these voters had to wait more than 30 minutes. With the new Bill 202, the risk of long lines is even greater. The Board of, of Elections need to take steps now to ensure that early voters do not have to suffer in long lines. To assist in reducing lines, I respectfully request the county to keep the old Board of Elections headquarters on Whitlock as an early voting location as the previous speaker suggested. In Cobb and Georgia's history, there have been too many restrictions on the right to vote. Cobb County should take a leading role in promoting and encouraging all residents to vote. I'm advocating for expansive and equitable access to voting in our community. Thanks again for adding an early voting Sunday, and I hope you will use the Whitlock location for early voting as well. Thank you, Mr. Bias. Mr. Sam Henderson. Hello, I'm Sam Henderson, a longtime resident of Marietta here. And I too would like to thank the board for your work on behalf of all the voters of Cobb. Um, and I remember uh, one uh, editorial letter in the Marietta Daily Journal that uh, asked if somehow uh, you, the board, had uh, decided that you, <laughs> you were a monarch of some sort and got to decide for everybody. I would like to thank you for doing your best to represent all the registered voters of Cobb County and not just those of us that have the flexibility and the luxury of showing up at a meeting in the middle of the workday. Thank you for your work to pay attention to the statistics about Sunday voting and so forth, but also to recognize that in a democracy with lots of different people, we want to do everything we possibly can to allow for early voting, uh, including for some people that only have the opportunity to vote on weekends. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to echo one other uh, thing that's been hinted at here. Uh, we make decisions about voting here in Georgia in a state that has a somewhat checkered past on who we've allowed to vote and who we have encouraged to vote. Personally, as a citizen of Georgia, and of Cobb County, I'm a little uh, bummed that our state stood against um, discredited election fraud theories, but then immediately passed a whole set of laws that will make it harder for a lot of legally registered voters to vote. Thank you for everything you do to expand uh, voting hours and possibilities and hold voting possibilities for doing Sunday afternoon voting in one case. Uh, and I also would add that uh, I hope maybe you will consider using the uh, former uh, Cobb County uh, office as an early voting site just to avoid confusion. A lot of people have waited in long lines in early voting, 
and I know everybody wants to try to minimize that as much as possible. Again, thank you for your work on behalf of all the registered voters of Cobb County. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Next up, is it uh, Barbara Schneider? Barbara I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. I am Barbara Seacrest Schmieds, a longtime resident of Marietta and Cobb County. I voted in virtually every election, large and small, since the early 1970s. And I have been attending these um, Board of Election meetings since February or March just to kind of have an opportunity to see how it all happens behind the curtains. And I appreciate these meetings being open to observers to just come in and see what you're doing. So thank you for that. I also want to thank you for the hard work that you're putting in to make sure that our elections are as accessible as possible. I appreciate the Sunday um, opening that, that you did at the last meeting. And while a lot of, of what I um, have heard already from previous ones has already been stated, I want to go on record with just the highlights. I want to encourage you to keep the Whitlock Avenue Board of Elections headquarters open uh, for the duration of this particular election cycle. It's such a critical one. We want to be sure that nobody is not able to vote simply because they go to the wrong location. Want to do? Want to encourage you to do whatever you can to keep the lines at a minimum. Um, I have used, I vote in a precinct that's in West Cobb that rarely has really long lines. But more recently, I've been doing early voting just because I wanted to be sure that my vote got in there. And um, and those those lines tend to be very long. You know, anywhere from a minimum of 30 minutes to several hours. So whatever you can do to eliminate those long lines, I really appreciate. I want to also encourage you to um, do the training necessary so that the poll workers do have the tools that they need in order to deal with any emergencies that come up. Um, and that as we go through the mail-in ballots that they are being um, attended to quickly so that if there are people who just simply made a mistake and we can get them uh, remedied and allow their vote to count, that that is, allow, is able to happen. Um, once again, thank you very much for all of your hard work. I, I see it each time that I come to these meetings and I believe that the transparency that you are putting forward um, to allow us to see exactly what goes into the decisions is very important and I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Mr. John Gargas. Good afternoon, John Gargas. I'm a, I'm a resident of Paulding, but I work here in the great county of Cobb County. Uh, I want to express my appreciation uh, to our state and this county elections board for giving voters three weeks of early voting, including weekend voting opportunities, especially in an environment where some are calling for voting to be held only on election day. It's a ridiculous notion, and I'll explain why. My friend had his birthday yesterday, and if you're a resident of Georgia, you, you know there's something important about being a Georgia resident and in your birthday. It's, it's that deadline to have your car tag renewed, or your car tax, taxes paid if, you're, if uh, you're still on the old system like I am. And in order to do that, you have to pass an emissions test. And that's what, a 10 minute wait once you get to that point of service? So maybe the length of a time it takes to do a primary or general election ballot. But when do you do it? Well, you have, you have to have a passing inspection within the last 12 months. Georgia's Clean Air Force recommends having your vehicle inspected four to six weeks prior to the registration renewal date. That's four to six weeks versus three weeks or so of early voting. Maybe three weeks of voting isn't enough, therefore. One day definitely isn't enough unless you would have a county's driving population to be able to do emissions tests all in one day. And not only that, but in the span of just 12 hours. That's not including voters who don't drive a car, from the elderly to young voters who may not drive or even own a car. And especially in Cobb County, whose 2021 population of more than 776,000 is larger, larger than the populations of Wyoming, Vermont, and Alaska. For those who say, why Saturday voting? Why Sunday voting? Why not? 
For numerous voters, those may be the most convenient days to vote, maybe, day, maybe days of fewer or no work obligations, no threat of being late to drop off or pick up their children from school or from daycare. Those weekend days are crucial in a world where people may be working multiple jobs to make ends meet. A reality for some, not just in today's economy, but even in years prior when income inequality hit its highest level in more than 50 years back in 2019. And looking back a tiny bit further, as a Cobb voter during the 2018 general election, I drove across the street to my polling place on election day, expecting to be in and out in a jiffy. Previous elections, I'd have little to no wait and would get to a machine almost immediately after going through registration. Instead, a long line greeted me and it took about 45 minutes to an hour uh, for me to get to a machine to cast my ballot. And even that might have been a minor wait compared to others uh, in other parts of the county. I'm hoping this board has made every effort to reduce wait time in this upcoming midterm primary. I, I don't see the time here, but if, if I do have time, and please. Two please. more minutes. Okay. One other thing I want to address is the, is the call from some to get rid of voting machines and to go to paper ballots. The funny thing is, even with, this, even with these machines, we have paper ballots. We punch in a few choices on a, on a screen, and these, what are called ballot marking devices, I believe are called, give us a marked paper ballot. It lists our choices in writing, and while it has a machine-readable code, it still lists written out votes that a human can read. And these same machine-produced ballots produce results that were confirmed in 2020 by, hand, by a hand count. Now, if I go to Kroger or Publix, I trust similar computer codes, barcodes, to be scanned accurately. And I get a receipt that confirms what was scanned, and if there's a mistake, I can get it corrected by a manager. The current election system seems very similar to this, and it's a fairly speedy process. Everyone wants to see results tabulated quickly after the polls close, and the current systems we have in place seem to facilitate that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Gargas. Ms. Debbie Fisher. Good afternoon. First, I'd like to congratulate all of you on the awesome open house and the new election facility that is just one of the most refreshing things I've seen in Cobb in a very long time. It has a whole different atmosphere. There's room, you can breathe, there's light. And the event on Sunday was really impressive. So my hat's off to all of you, especially Janine who had the vision for that building a long time ago. I'm gonna ask her for numbers for the lottery um, since she hit 20 out of 22 points. Um, but that aside, down to business, I sent you all an email with a video in it that I think you all need to watch. It is about a current case that is being um, uh, hopefully adjudicated in um, Florida. And the investigation was actually taken from a Georgian who has previously reported on voter roll inaccuracies here in Georgia and slash Cobb County. And when I reflected in watching that video back on what happened in July, and June, with our voter challenges, not ours, there were individuals who put before this board legitimate voter challenges. And from an outsider looking in, there seemed to be more deflection than there was reflection on those challenges. And today, we don't have those challenges removed from our voter rolls. In addition to that, I want to point out that on the voter registration cards that were mailed late due to the Secretary of State getting them to Cobb County late, an estimated 30,000 of those cards were returned. Think about that just for a moment, 30,000. I believe we have 500 and some thousand registered voters that's a pretty significant number to bounce back. 
I know that several of the people who challenged the um, several people on our voter rolls recommended to you all that quarterly you reflect back on the NCOA, National Change of Address List. It's provided to government entities for free. If we do that, we have to pay for it. You don't. It's an easy way to circumvent spending postage on 30,000 postcards and getting them back only to turn around and remail a notification to the same address that just bounced. Think about that. Does that make any sense at all? I mean, seriously, it makes no sense to me that one would do that. You can check those easily through the NCOA. And I highly, again, recommend that we do. And the previous speakers prior to me, I've heard a lot of things that um, I think should be clarified. I've been pretty involved in elections for many years in a row. I have never seen the lines that several of the previous speakers were talking about except in very isolated instances. I think Cobb County Elections does a fabulous job of moving the lines. I also want to point out that when the Secretary of State sent out blindly ballots for everyone due to a pandemic, total chaos and havoc was wreaked from doing that. It was sent out to every single person, whether they wanted to vote by absentee or not. Many people, you talk about voter suppression, many people were suppressed from being able to vote because those ballots were mailed out, yet that individual didn't vote absentee, so when they showed up at the polls, they were not allowed to vote. So it goes both ways. So. I wanted to clarify that, and I also want to clarify, I think Cobb Elections does an excellent job in making sure one voter, one vote counted. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. That's your five minutes. Sabrina Golo, Golau? Gavin, Mike, Milton, Got it. Thank you. My name is Sabrina Gallen. I'm a Cobb County resident and have voted in every election since I have lived in Georgia. Um, and I had an opportunity, well, thank you for, for letting me come up here. I forgot to thank the board, but thank you. Um, I am glad that I have started to become involved in this process. It's a good idea to see how things work uh, from the inside. Uh, this is the second time that I've attended this meeting and I hope to continue to attend them. So that I understand the process. Um, I'm very happy that during the last meeting that extended voting was granted for Sunday, and I think I gave a couple of comments why historically that's important to a demographic. Um, but also, I just wanted to reiterate with, reiterate or, well, I'm not getting the right word here, but anyway, many of the uh, my fellow Cobb County residents have already stated today about the importance of doing everything that we can to expand voting uh, to make sure it's uh, equitable for, for everyone. And if we can find a way to keep um, polling locations that people are familiar with available, uh, additional hours, early voting, vote by mail, whatever we can do to ensure the process for everyone, not just a select few, pe few people, but for everyone who could benefit from that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gallen. Mr. Ahmad Salis. My name is Ahmad Salis. I'm a resident of Vinings. Um, in the third century AD, Emperor Constantine um, converted to Christianity and subsequently uh, stopped a lot of the persecution of the Christians and thus ended the uh, age of the martyrs. And after that, 
came the age of the desert monks. They would go out into uh, mountains and deserts and live in caves and spend a life of solitude. They came to believe that silence was a more direct path to God. Um, coming to these board meetings, I've seen the futility of words spoken on both sides. So today I've decided to adopt the message of the desert monks and give one minute of silence starting now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sully. The next up is Mr. Boyd Parks. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I'm still Boyd Parks from Ackworth. <clears throat> Thank you for giving us time to speak on your agenda. I want to note uh, um, one of our previous speakers, Mr. Henderson, uh, intimated that we live in a democracy. I just want to put it on the record that we do not. We live in a constitutional republic. Thank you for the invitation to the ribbon cutting and the great open house Saturday at the awesome new Cobb County Election Registration Headquarters facility. I was truly impressed and am very pleased with that and everything about it. <clears throat> On to election integrity. My wife cautions people to avoid asking me what time it is because before I answer that question, I have to tell them how a watch is made and how it works. It is my nature. Before I can accept any system, I have to understand how it works. My brother and I, as youngsters, experimented with many things. For whatever reason, we wanted to know how much force it took to break a 78 RPM record. We also wanted to know how we could break 45 RPM and 33 RPM records. For any youngsters uh, in the audience listening, uh, records were those things that, record, that music was recorded on. <clears throat> we were not dummies, just wanting to break things. You might think of us as young engineers testing the strength and properties of various types of plastic. Later in life, NASA hired my brother to try to determine why the Hubble telescope was unable to focus. He spent six weeks at the Hubble factory and finally discovered the problem. My discoveries are not nearly so monumental, but they're just as logical. I say all that not to blow any horns, but to illustrate that I am a logical thinker and am able to critically analyze many things. Relative to assets and elections, we spend a lot of time talking about the concept of chain of custody and how vital that concept and its actual documentation are. <clears throat> As I understand the certification process, the election superintendent must understand all the details step by step in the entire election process in order to tell the board that they can honestly and accurately certify an election. On the other hand, if the superintendent does not know, for instance, that the proprietary code symbol often incorrectly referred to as a QR code, that the BMD prints on the ballot actually contains exactly the same data as the list of voter-selected candidates, then how can he or she 
with full knowledge tell the board that they should raise their hands and swear to the total accuracy of the election. I have researched this, but I, I have not researched this, but I believe that Cobb County has a bond for each of you board members and Ms. Evelar as well. I believe that each of you has a sworn, also has a sworn oath of office. Again, I am a, just a critical thinker, not an attorney, but I understand that officials who violate their oaths can be held liable both in their position and individually for oath violations. <clears throat> it seems to me that to protect yourselves from severe liabilities that you should take the readily available option to conduct the 2022 general election on hand-marked paper ballots counted manually at the precinct. Please ponder that total, please ponder that totally legal path. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Parks. And our last speaker will be Ms. Carol Asta. Good afternoon. My name is Carol Aston. I'm a registered voter in Cobb County. I have two points today. First, I'd like to learn what happened to the challenge presented on August 8th meeting. No vote was taken. And second, I just wanted to say that I have presented solid evidence that these voters now challenged under the provision of Georgia Code 230 have moved and registered in, the, in another state. If they are not to be removed under Section 229, I now that they be marked as challenged under Section 230. Thank you, Ms. Asta. Moving on to the next item on the agenda is the approval of our meeting minutes for our two previous meetings um, <coughs> held on July the 11th, 2022, and August 8th, 2022. Have all board members had an opportunity to review the board meeting minutes? Are there any comments, proposed amendments? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve um, both the July 11th and August 8th meeting minutes. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Is there a second? It's moved and been properly seconded to approve the July 11th and August 8th meeting minutes. All those in favor, if you'll note as much. The motion unanimously um, carries. We have no items for public hearing today. Uh, we'll move on to item four as noted on the agenda. Ms. Hamilton. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to give you a brief update on the status of the last call pre-election day ballot return, um, formerly known as the 2021 library project for the november 2021 election a committee was formed to provide a testing ground for a new and innovative location option of mail ballots establish workable procedures and to assess voter response the committee found the project to be a success and reached out to our office to continue the project for the 22 2022 election cycle the office agreed that we can continue the project um, with this starting with the 2020 general election um, and with a few recommended changes and a better marketing plan. The first change was to rename the project. Um, I think the name of it was confusing a lot of people, so we took the name from uh, 2021 Library Project to the last call pre-election day ballot return. The second change was the increased accessibility by increasing the number of available locations. In October 2021, the project was offered at three libraries within the county, East Cobb, West Cobb and Powder Springs. And as you note on your handout, we have increased that to seven libraries, East Cobb, Mountain View, North Cobb, Vinings, Switzer, Powder Springs, and South Cobb, um, and the locations are listed on the handout. The program will be available the Saturday and Monday prior to election day. We picked these days because these are the days that the drop box would close and it would give the uh, voters an opportunity to turn in their ballots in person but prior to election day. The hours of the project will be Saturday, November 5th from 10 to 5, and Monday, November 7th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
We are, recruitment efforts have been go, begun to have three deputy registrars at each location who will check the information on the back of that ballot envelope and accept on site the ballots that meet the acceptance criteria. And then we'll designate those that need additional oversight by our absentee department for further review, such as those that need to be cured if there's missing information or if there's mismatch information. Our ballots will be kept securely at the location until they're picked up by sworn authorized uh, couriers, and um, then we'll process them as we would any other ballot. Are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. Does anyone have on the board have questions for Ms. Hamilton? I think my only question is about our marketing plan, mm -hmm. which I think we early on recognized we needed to improve. So we will be doing flyers, putting stuff on our website. As the flyer you have, we'll go ahead and put that out, put it on our website, and we're also looking into other marketing ideas. The committee has gotten together to think about some um, more expansive marketing ideas. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Are there any other questions? Comments to be shared with Ms. Hamilton. Thank you. Hearing none, thank you. Thank you. Moving to the next item on the agenda, Ms. Eller. Yes, thank you, Chairwoman. Um, the Secretary of State's office has notified us that due to the November 11th uh, Veterans Day holiday, that several of the due dates and deadlines um, on our schedule are going to have to be moved one day. So previously we had until November 11th to uh, finish up any provisional processes, uh, receive the overseas and military ballots, um, and uh, receive any cure affidavits by that date. But because that is a, a federal holiday, um, it's a state holiday, it's a county holiday, then um, we won't have any mail processed that day and we're closed. So the state has recommended then that the deadline to certify the election is, uh, I'm sorry, the deadline to uh, receive all those uh, last minute items is now Monday, November 14th. And the deadline for counties to certify is 5 p.m. November 15th. Uh, we would like to move our certification meeting to that November 15th date at 3 p.m. and we will be locating that at our new main office on Roswell Street because we cannot get this room. So I'd ask the board to uh, approve that move. Okay. Are there any questions for Ms. Eveler? No. Uh, hearing none, is there a motion to approve the uh, changing of the date of the certification meeting to November? Thank you, Mr. Gartland. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Bruning. It's been moved and properly seconded to change our certification meeting to November the 15th at 3 p.m. at the new facility at 995 Roswell Street. I'll call the question. Those in favor? The motion carries unanimously. Uh, as noted earlier, at the outset of the meeting, we would um, flip-flop uh, item six and seven. So at this point, we'll open up for any board member comments. Yes, please go ahead, Ms. Mosswalker. I just wanted to give a shout out to all the staff for Saturday. Yes. I thought it was phenomenal, the program that you guys ran, and I thought that it was really transparent and wonderful to be able to see the building in that way. And I think Tammy did an awesome job designing shirts and all the posters, and I think everybody just really came together well as a team, and it went well. So thanks so much for doing that. I echo um, those comments in as much that the team did an amazing job. Um, and I said it on Saturday, I'll repeat it now. I'm appreciative of the forethought. Uh, I think dating back to 2013, I believe you said it was, um, in my, our predecessors coming to you and requesting um, you to pull together, quote, that white paper. Um, and as noted, I believe by Ms. Fisher, 22 items of the uh, things that you noted in that white paper, you, you got 20 of them, that's not a bad batting average. Um, all that being said, um, the promotion and the attendance and the interest of members of our county to um, show up 
in, you know, rain and, and poor weather notwithstanding was great. And so I thank you and, and the staff for that. I'll also uh, just make one additional item. There have been a number of uh, comments that have been made during the course of today's meeting with respect to Whitlock. I just find it important to uh, note for those uh, within the hearing of my voice that that decision was made um, already and we're not in a position to uh, go back unless any member of this board um, determines it appropriate. Um, but at our last meeting we voted and this board voted and approved the locations, the early voting locations. And so um, in doing so, we did speak with Ms. Evler and her team about adequate marketing and adequate, adequate taking adequate measures such that if individuals do uh, show up at Whitlock, and we would anticipate that they will, um, that there will be appropriate signage, there will be appropriate individuals um, having maps to direct them to the no location. And I'll defer to you, Ms. Evler, to tell me exactly how, how far, I believe it's seven miles? Uh, no, it was seven miles to our warehouse. To our warehouse. Yeah. Okay. Um, I honestly haven't mapped it out, but I think it's somewhere in the, in the realm of two three. miles. Okay, mm -hmm. two to three. So it's even closer than I anticipated. <laughs> so, um, But I did want to make that point, um, given some of the comments that have been made during the public comment. Mr. Bruni? I'd just like to echo the comments about the great new facility. It's uh, uh, fantastic. It, I, it actually will make the process so much more efficient and there's so much more room for the voters to wait for advanced voting and it's in air condition. So I would heartily recommend folks to use that facility for their early voting. Uh, I, I only have one devil's advocate question is, what was number 21? And 22. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I didn't go into that in the, in the uh, presentation, but one of them was that we had 10 voting windows and we only have nine. And the reason we only have nine is there was an unexpected steel beam in the wall. And so that 10th one wasn't able to be cut. Um, and then the, the last one was adequate parking of 400 spaces. And we understand and everyone's aware that parking is an issue there. And we are working f with uh, some of the surrounding uh, businesses to get some overflow parking or, uh, leases in place. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that question. If there's nothing further for board uh, member comments, we'll go back to uh, item number six. Um, as Ms. Astamade mentioned during her public comments, there were a number of challenges that were previously submitted. Those were submitted under Section 229. At the conclusion of last month's meeting, I did note that in light of the fact that Section 229 requires, or the, the result, if you will, of sustaining a challenge under Section 229 would require removal of um, individuals from the voter roll. and. August the 10th was the final date within which, or prior to which, a, um, a voter could be removed under the National Voter Registration Act, that we would not be taking any type of um, action on those. And, and that was clearly stated uh, during the, the course of the meeting. Um, all that being said, as I understand it, a number of the uh, challenges or elected electors that were challenged under Section 229, as Ms. Astor herself made note of, have been are being represented under represented under Section 230. That being the case, the next item um, on the agenda is taking up those uh, challenges under Section 230. Um, for everyone's purposes, I think it's always extremely important for folks to understand. Um, while I don't impose upon you the obligation of reading Section 230, that's uh, to, you know, the responsibility of myself, my colleagues, and, and our, our counsel, uh, Daniel White. Um, Section 230 challenges are different from Section 229 challenges. Section 229 challenges, if resolved under that provision of the code, would, as I just noted, require a removal of a elector from the voter roll. Uh, Section 230 is not handled in the same manner in as much that it is a challenge to the ability of that elector to vote at the next election. 
Um, in addition to that, it's specifically set, set forth in the code that this body, the Board of Elections, will determine as to whether there is probable cause. Um, and in the event we find that there is probable cause, there is, to remove an elector from, I'm sorry, to uh, challenge or sustain the challenge to an elector, there are certain steps that we would be required to take um, as it relates to noting that that elector is challenged, uh, as well as providing notice to the precinct at which that elector would vote at. So I want to, I thought it important to draw that distinction for everyone that's here and that's everyone that's participating uh, virtually such that you understand why the process um, by which that we will take up this, these 230 challenges, why it differs. It will absolutely differ from the manner in which we're, we've previously taken up 229 challenges. Um, at this point, I'll defer to my counsel or our counsel. Do you have anything further to add with regard to that point? No, I, I, I think I, I've tried to uh, answer any questions that the board had, you know, individually ahead of time. I do. I think you're correct. I would just add um, the first, you know, the code section says uh, that the board shall determine whether there's probable cause immediately. Uh, we took that and read that as at our next available meeting. And so that's why we're bringing it forward tonight. Um, there, depending on what actions are taken, there are, you know, if it, uh, there are multiple uh, p determinations that the, that the board can make tonight, and if anybody ends up being challenged, uh, it's different if they cast, try to cast an absentee ballot versus if they show up at the precinct versus if they don't show up at all, and there could end up even be there could even end up trans transitioning some of these into a 229 challenge uh, if no if they don't show up and they don't try to vote by absentee. So that's a it's a quite a matrix of possibilities in 230, but I, so it can get a little confusing to try to explain it to everybody succinctly in public, but I try to answer questions ahead of time if the board had them and we can, but we are tonight is, or today is the day that we're gonna make the probable cause determination. Okay, and thank you for that. I think that's a perfect segue. So having reviewed um, the information, the materials that were provided, uh, there are a number of items that need to be <coughs> taken up. Ms. Evler, how do you want, I know we conversed via email with respect to the, there was, th you know, for everyone's purposes, there were three separate challengers that submitted 230 challenges. As Ms. Asta made mention of, she is one of them, a Mr. Eugene Williams and then a Mr. William Lang. Um, how we are going to move forward first. Go ahead, Ms. Evelyn. Oh, um, I was just getting ready, but no. um, uh, what I was checking um, when I looked these voters up is just whether they were still Georgia residents and um, you know whether they were still registered. So Ms. Asta's challenge, all the, the voters on that list are uh, active registered voters and the same with Mr. Lang's. Mr. Williams, uh, had several voters on his list that are actually already canceled due to them returning a letter to ask to be removed from the list. So his list has been edited and you've been provided with a, an additional uh, list that's separate from what's in the agenda, indicating that 32 voters on his challenge, of course, cannot be challenged because they are already canceled of their own choice. And then there were two voters on this list that I was not able to identify. There was not enough information to find that whether those voters are registered or not. Okay. So if I could parrot that back uh, to uh, be certain that uh, Ms. Mossbacher has the opportunity to capture this in the uh, meeting minutes. So Mr. Williams submitted a uh, 320, pardon me, 230 challenge to 148 uh, electors. Of those 148 electors, 32 um, cons were removed by their own uh, action. And then there were two uh, electors that, based upon Ms. Evler's office's review, we were unable to match based upon um, inconsistency in information. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So at this point, the question is a matter of probable cause um, as to whether uh, there is probable cause to sustain 
um, these challenges. And it's necessary to go into executive session as we are going to be in need of um, advice from council. And so if you've been with us before, previously for any of our meetings during executive session, we ask that all individuals um, proceed into the hallway. We will work as ex expeditiously as possible. Um, but when there is a need for advice and counsel and matters that uh, could be subject to litigation, this is the process that we undertake. Yes.
Perfect. Is there a motion to come out of executive session? Yes. Thank Second. you, Mr. Been moved and properly seconded to come out of executive session. Call a question. Those in favor? The motion unanimously passes. Um, thank everyone for their patience. At the outset, uh, Daniel is going to provide an overview probably a little bit more succinctly than I did with regard to the distinction between Section 229 challenges and 230. I think that will provide um, a sense of understanding or a basis for understanding how we're going to move forward with this. Go right ahead, Daniel, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, uh, as, as the board, as we've discussed uh, prior to the executive session, 229 hearings deal with removal and there is a different standard of notice and an opportunity to be heard with regard to 229 because that involves actual removal from the voting list. Under 230, this is just a challenge um, to uh, the voters' ability to vote in the upcoming election. And if you read 230, Section B um, says you don't have the hearing uh, ahead of the, uh, for, for the, to challenge their qualifications ahead of it. You just, what this board is charged to do is uh, upon the filing of such a challenge, the Board of Registrars shall immediately consider such challenge and determine whether probable cause exists to sustain such challenge. So the Board's job today is to, to determine whether there is probable cause to sustain the challenge as presented um, by Mr. Williams and Ms. Asta. And, um, or excuse me, what now? Yes, oh, and, th and yes, the three challenges that were submitted. Um, and I think there's a total of 184 challenges. I do just, um, if, you, if you'll give me just another 30 seconds to explain what the board's looking at here, um, they're, they're just briefly to give you some context. Um, the NVRA prevents, challenge, prevents removal of voters under a systematic removal for 90 days before the election. We are now in that period, uh, but there has been a case in Georgia that talks about how 230 um, challenges fit under that. And in that case, it's a middle Georgia uh, federal case called Majority Ford versus Ben Hill County of Board of Elections. It says uh, individualized removals and challenges do not present the same risks as systematic removals because they're based on individual correspondence or rigorous individualized inquiry leading to a smaller chance for mistakes. That case then goes on to talk about that those boards actually didn't do what was required to find. They didn't have a rigorous uh, inquiry. Uh, and it talks about uh, the factors that would go into whether you were able to make an inquiry, uh, whether you're able to have enough evidence before the board um, to make the rigorous individualized inquiry that is required under those cases. So I believe the board discussed that standard and uh, has a motion to make regarding the list that were provided uh, for the 230 challenges. Okay. So as, um, as Mr. White made reference to, we do have a motion to put forth and it's, it, it's consistent with the rigorous inquiry. Um, that we believe to be necessary as stated in um, legal and binding precedent um, that we undertake that, that rigorous inquiry. And so the motion on the floor would be to, I'm sorry, let me go ahead and state the, the, how we are reaching probable cause. So I think we can all agree, and it's been previously stated, that simply being on in the NCOA list is insufficient, especially given where we are in the timing of things, the 90-day uh, period. So what we as a board have determined, it's the uh, whether a voter has voted in a um, prior election, I'm sorry, a subsequent election following their registration that is consistent with decisions that we've made um, with regard to 229 challenges. So the motion is as follows. Um, we move to sustain a finding of probable cause as to those voters on the challenge list who are identified as both having registered and subsequently voted subject to verification by the Cobb Board of, Board of Election staff and to deny a finding of probable, probable cause as to the remaining voters on the list as presented by the three challengers. Um, that is the motion. Um, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Bruning. It's been properly moved and seconded. Um, we'll go ahead and call the, the question. All those in favor of approving this motion? There, are no, there is no opposition. The motion um, passes. So to the extent that 
Um, I, I do note that Ms. Asta is obviously here. I don't believe the other two challengers are here. I don't know Mr. Lang, my apologies. That's why I said I didn't believe. Um, mm -hmm. I've not had the pleasure of meeting you, Mr. Lang. A, a pleasure to meet you. So what that motion does is, and as Mr. Um, White stated, the way that these operate, there is no opportunity for a hearing at this juncture. Um, in the event, following Ms. Evler's office's validation with regard to the standard that we just um, identified, you will be provided with um, notice as to how things are, how it moves forward, whether that validation of the, of the elector having voted in another state, um, whether that's been confirmed, and then we will advise you of such, and then the process as outlined in section 230 will move forward. So, um, with that, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, uh, which is our next, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the announcement of our next scheduled board meeting. It will take place October the 10th, um, confirming we are here. Yeah, we will be here. And we've already had board comment. Um, we've already had executive sessions. So with that, the meeting is adjourned at 4.52 p.m. <laughs>